verses 22 to um, 33, but we will focus in on verses 29 to 33. <clears throat> and that is Acts chapter 2. You might be wondering if we are ever going to get out of Acts chapter 2, um, but fear not, uh, we are making progress with this. Uh, but I do want to take time in this particular section uh, because this is the first recorded sermon um, from the Apostle Peter at the early church. And what does it focus on? It focuses on our Lord Jesus Christ, um, mainly his resurrection and his exaltation. But we, we are making progress, so do not grow faint of heart. So Acts chapter 2, verses 22 to... Alright, well, there we go. Alright, the power is coming on. And don't worry about that as well. Like, you know, I was reading in Acts uh, yesterday or today where, you know, they prayed and then the earth shook. And so, you know, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. So maybe, uh, Lord willing, that will, something similar will take place today. Uh, even if the lights go out, and if they do, we will continue on. Uh, so Acts chapter 2, 22 to 33. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst as you yourselves know. This Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pains of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades, or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. <coughs> Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David, that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your word, and we thank you that it is a light onto our path, a lamp to our feet, and I pray that we will follow your word, that we will learn from it, and in so doing, learn more about you and what you have done, especially through your Son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, I ask that you will fill me with your Holy Spirit and speak through me. And Lord, that we will hear and we will take to heart these words and we will be encouraged that our Lord Jesus Christ is indeed risen from the dead and at your right hand. And so we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, while America once enjoyed the fruits of Christian influence, it now experiences the dry husks of a post-Christian culture. In an age where almost anything goes in terms of morality, it is a culture of confusion on the verge of violence. Our culture has practically no foundation, no stability, and as a result, no hope. This is the age and the culture that we live in currently. Yet, as the Church of Jesus Christ, we remain the pillar and buttress of truth. We stand upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Jesus Christ as our cornerstone. His deity and His humanity, His incarnation, His life, His ministry, His death, His resurrection, His ascension are fundamental to our faith, foundational to our faith. And if we are to live in a post-Christian culture on the brink of being an anti-Christian culture, then we must stand firmly upon Christ. 
We must know Him and we must know why we believe as we do. If there are holes in our foundation, then we must shore them up so that we will be able to have a strong foundation to stand upon, strong in the midst of sifting sand. On Christ the solid rock we stand, all other ground is sinking sand. As we come to this passage of scripture in Peter's Pentecost sermon, we will notice that he focuses in on the resurrection and exaltation of Christ. At the beginning of his Pentecost sermon, he explained the, the events of Pentecost through the prophet Joel. He then moves on and talks very briefly about the life of Jesus Christ, his ministry, his death, and then his resurrection. Then he quotes from Psalm 16 that refers to the Lord Jesus Christ that foretold of the resurrection of Christ. And now in these verses, he comes and he offers proofs of the resurrection to his audience. Now, let us imagine for a moment that a court is set up. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is set on trial. A judge ascends to his seat, takes the gavel, and calls the court to session. In his dry voice, he says to Christianity, Present your case. You have said that your Jesus was raised from the dead on the third day. Present your case to us. Christianity then rises, looks at the jury, and then addresses the judge. Your honor, we hold fast that our Lord Jesus Christ was raised from the dead by God. We will present you with these proofs from Peter's Pentecost sermon. We will answer your question, what is the proof of the resurrection, or how do you know that Jesus rose from the dead? We have three proofs for you to consider. Each proof builds on the previous one. Let us begin with proof number one, the proof of scripture fulfillment. Here, Christianity presents a book and opens it and flips to the Psalm 16, verses 8 to 11. And as we learned last week, she says these verses were fulfilled in our Lord Jesus Christ. The Apostle Peter quoted these verses in his Pentecost sermon, and as we will see, he directly applied them to Jesus Christ. We might imagine the jury objecting and saying, these verses were written by a man named David. Why then do you say that they apply to the Christ and not to David? How do they prove of the resurrection? And then Peter begins to give the reasons for why they do. <clears throat> In verse 29, he says, Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us here today. Reason number one why this refers to Christ and his resurrection, David died. Peter's argument is this, yes, King David wrote the, this psalm that I just quoted, yet in this psalm he writes, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. He speaks of the resurrection of somebody, yet this cannot refer to David. Well, why? Peter says with boldness, hey, this verse is not about David the king. You know that David died centuries ago and was buried in a tomb. In fact, his tomb is still with us today. If you could enter it, you would see a pile of bones. He succumbed to corruption and decay. David died. Scripture testifies to this in 1 Kings 2.10. Then David slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David. If anyone doubted this, Peter said, hey, just take a walk down the road, take a right, and there's the cemetery. Go in and you cannot miss it. There is King David's tomb. Anybody in Jerusalem could go to the tomb of David and see that there he was. He had died. <clears throat> this cannot refer, therefore, this psalm cannot refer to David. Okay, David died. Now what? How is this psalm fulfilled in Christ? Peter continued and gave the second reason, reason number two, a promised heir. Even though David died, <clears throat> God promised him an heir, a descendant from him that would sit upon his throne. We read in verse 30, being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne. Here, we are introduced to the notion that David is called a prophet. And now while he was not a prophet like Isaiah or Ezekiel or the prophet Joel, the Holy Spirit did come upon him and carry him along, and he did write many psalms 
that are prophetic in nature. <clears throat> Thus, he was classified as a prophet who searched and inquired carefully about Christ's sufferings and subsequent glories. Now, we read in verse 30 that God had sworn with an oath to him that one of his descendants would sit on his throne. This is a loose translation of Psalm 132, verse 11. The Lord swore to David a sure oath from which he will not turn back. One of the sons of your body I will set on your throne. Now, this refers to an event in 2 Samuel chapter 7. David wanted to build a house for God. And the prophet Nathan came and said, okay, do as you say. But then later he came back and said, no, um, you are not the one who is going to build it. And your, one of your descendants would build the house. And then the Lord said in 2 Samuel 7, verses 12 and 13 and verse 16, When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. Well, the immediate context refers to King Solomon. Solomon eventually died. He built the temple, but he eventually died. These verses ultimately thus refer to David's ultimate descendant, who would assume the, sh the kingship forever. Thus, this man who would eventually assume the throne, either one, had to live forever, or two, die and rise again. Now, we know that when God makes a note, He keeps it to the end. He will not turn back on His solemn promise. God is not a man that He should lie, or a son of man that He should change His mind. Has He said, and will He not do it? Or has He spoken, and will He not fulfill it? And the author of Hebrews assures us it is impossible for God to lie. When God makes a promise, Death cannot nullify that promise. He will fulfill it to the very end. And so he promised David, one of your descendants will sit on the throne forever. And thus it came to be. God is all powerful and he is always faithful. Therefore, he will keep his promises. If this is true, then how then could God establish the throne of David forever? How is this possible if King David and his descendants die? Furthermore, when Peter preached this sermon, one of the sons of David was not sitting on the throne of Israel. So how could it be fulfilled? This leads us to the third reason, namely, when David spoke, he spoke about the resurrection of Christ. Reason number three, David therefore spoke about the resurrection of Christ. We read in verse 31, he foresaw, that is David foresaw, and spoke about the resurrection of Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. As I mentioned before, David is classified as a prophet, therefore he foresaw and he foretold, he spoke about the resurrection of Christ. Here, Peter applies the words from the psalm that he had quoted that the Christ will not uh, be abandoned to Hades. He will not see his flesh become corrupted. <clears throat> since David did not speak these words about himself, and since one of his own sons, his ultimate descendant, would assume the throne of his kingdom forever, it is logical that it must refer to the resurrection of somebody, and that resurrection that resurrected somebody is Christ. Christ rose again from the dead. He is alive. And this is the proof that he, is, he fulfilled scripture. His father did not abandon his soul to Hades. His father did not let his flesh see corruption. But his father came and raised him up from the dead and he is alive. Coming back to the imagery of the court, we can now imagine Christianity closing the book and saying, that is proof number one. The psalm was fulfilled and Christ rose from the dead. The scripture was fulfilled. This is proof. <clears throat> the judge now might ask a second question. 
and say, very well, we consent that this is proof, yet who then is the Christ? How do we know that Jesus is the Christ, the Anointed One? And we have seen the proof of Scripture fulfillment, and now let us go to proof of the eyewitnesses. <clears throat> Peter then declares in verse 32, This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. In Peter's Pentecost sermon, he had already mentioned in verse 24 that God raised Jesus up, loosing the pains of death because it was impossible, was not possible for him to be held by it. Again, he reminds his audience of the resurrection of Jesus. How do we know that Jesus of Nazareth is the Christ, the anointed one? Well, one, Peter said, this Jesus God raised up. If God raised this Jesus up, then he is the Christ. He is the anointed one, God's son in whom he is pleased and in whom he loves. Jesus was a man attested by God with mighty works and wonders and signs, as Peter said earlier. Yet he is no mere man. God raised him from the dead and proved that he is the Christ. This is the logical conclusion that Peter will make at the end of his sermon. Two, Peter declared that they, that is the apostles, were eyewitnesses of Jesus' resurrection. What is an eyewitness? An eyewitness is someone who has seen or heard or experienced something and then testifies to it. What proof do we have of the resurrection of Jesus? Peter, in essence, says, hey, there are 12 of us that have seen the resurrected Christ. I don't know if you realize this, but an eye, the eyewitness accounts are part of the gospel witness. The Apostle Paul said, For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He raised again from, was raised again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Cephas for Peter and then to the Twelve. The eyewitnesses to Christ's resurrection were of utmost importance to establish the truth of the resurrection. Again, imagine the court case on earth. Christianity has already presented the proof of scripture fulfillment, and now she says, here are the eyewitnesses. And we can imagine the judge calling for Peter to come forward. Peter, you tell us that this Jesus rose from the dead. Peter responds, yes, your honor, I believe that Jesus died and rose again. The judge asks, well, how do you know it is true? And Peter responds, about three years ago, Jesus came and to me and called me away from my fisherman's job. Throughout these three years, I saw him open the eyes of the blind, raise the dead, heal the paralytic. I saw him calm a storm. Then, at the end of these three years, at the Passover feast, he told us that one of his trusted 12 disciples is going to betray him and that we would all fall away. And I said, absolutely not, Lord. Though they fall away, I will not. Well, he took us to a garden where he prayed, and I and the others fell asleep. He kept telling us to stay awake and pray, but we were tired. When we woke, there was a crowd led by Judas Iscariot. I tried to defend him, but he said, it must happen this way. Well, they arrested him, took him away, but I followed close behind. There in the courtyard, as Jesus told the truth to the high priest, I cowered before a servant girl and denied my Lord three times. And the rooster crowed. The judge might interrupt, well, this is all very nice, Peter, but go on with the point. The point is, I denied him, Peter says. They condemned him, took him to Pilate, and he was crucified, he died, and was buried. Yes, we know that, the judge might say. Well, three days later, Mary Magdalene and some of the other women came to us, and they said, he's alive. We went to his tomb, and his body's not there. We saw some angels that said he was alive. And so John and I ran to the tomb. We got there, and we found it as the women had said. We came back to the upper room, and as we were waiting, there Jesus appeared to, to us. And there we saw him with our eyes. We heard him with our ears. We were able to touch him. He showed us his hands and his feet. He is alive. He even ate a piece of broiled fish. He's alive. And then Peter might go on and tell about, well, a little while later, we went fishing. We caught nothing all night, but in the morning, a figure stood on the shoreline and told us to cast our net on the right side. We did, and we caught 153 fish. Well, that's nice, the judge might say. But then Peter says, we knew it was the Lord. He asked me three times whether I loved him or not, and I told him I did. And even though I denied him, he restored me. 
And now, even though I denied him once, I stand on the rooftop and proclaim that Jesus is Christ and is alive. The judge dismisses Peter, calls up Thomas. You say that this Jesus is alive. How do you know? Imagine Thomas' response. I doubted that he rose again. I, was some, I went somewhere and I came back and the other disciples, the other disciples told me he's alive. And I said, you know, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hands into his side, I will never believe. Well, about eight days later, guess who showed up? Jesus showed up in the room and he said to me directly, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe, I said, my Lord and my God. And if the judge should call any other of the twelve apostles, Bartholomew or John or any one of them, they would say the same thing. They were eyewitnesses that they saw Jesus arrested, betrayed, crucified, died, and buried. Now they could say, we saw him again. He is alive. As one said, Jesus' resurrection is not a fabricated myth, a symbol or a metaphor, or the appearance of a disembodied spirit or ghost. No, indeed, Jesus is the Christ, and he has risen from the dead. We have the eyewitness accounts in the Bible, in the Gospels, that he is alive. So we have seen the proof of scripture fulfillment from Psalm 16, that that was fulfilled by the resurrected Christ. We have seen proof number two of the eyewitnesses of his resurrection. And now let us examine the third proof, the proof of Pentecost. Again, if we imagine the courtroom setting, we can imagine the judge saying, okay, Christianity, you have provided proof that scripture was fulfilled in Jesus. You have provided proof that of the eyewitness accounts. What else do you have? You said you had one more. And for this, Christianity says, the proof of Pentecost. Now, we read in verse 33, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. How do we know that God raised Jesus up from the dead? Peter then offers the proof of the resurrection of this Jesus, namely, what happened on Pentecost morning. It was not a coincidence. It was something deliberate. Since Jesus is the Christ, the ultimate descendant of David, who will assume the heavenly throne of David, and since he was raised up by God, he is exalted at the right hand of God. And there at the right hand of God, he received the promised Holy Spirit, and that he poured out upon the apostles, upon the group that were gathered there. How do we know that he ascended and is at the right hand of God? Listen to what Peter says. Jesus, having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. In other words, when Christ ascended to heaven, he received the Spirit, he poured it out upon his apostles. And so now Peter was able to say, if you have any doubt at all that Jesus Christ is alive, look at what is happening here today. You are hearing in your own language, in your own dialects, the praise of God. How is this possible? Because God has poured out His Holy Spirit. How do we know God has poured out His Holy Spirit? Jesus Christ has risen. He is ascended. He is the risen and exalted Christ. And so now that we have seen the proofs of the resurrection, the proof of fulfillment, the proof of eyewitnesses, the proof of Pentecost, what must we do with this? What do we do with this? First, believe in the resurrected and exalted Jesus. He died on the cross for your sins, but lo and behold, He is alive. Here is a feast for your hungry soul. You have heard and you have seen that this is bread, that the, this, the proof, here is the proof that this is bread. Go to it and eat it. Don't doubt it. Come and taste it, feast on him. You who are tossed about by the waves and winds of the world, those of you who are sinking fast in sin, here is a firm foundation upon which you can stand. This is not a blind leap of faith. Here are the proofs of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus fulfilled prophecies concerning him. 
Jesus had eyewitnesses that he rose again from the dead. And the proof of Pentecost, he sent the Holy Spirit to his people to prove that he was resurrected and exalted to the right hand of God. Here is proof. Now believe in him. Believe in him. Trust him with all your heart. It is a sure foundation for which you are able to stand upon. Second, my brothers and sisters in Christ, let Christ's resurrection and exaltation comfort you, especially as you approach death. We as Christians do not have to fear death. We believe that Jesus Christ conquered the grave. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? It is lost in the glorious resurrection of Jesus Christ. Up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph over his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain and lives forever with the saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. Jesus Christ conquered death. Therefore, when we face death, the last enemy, we have no reason to fear. He who conquered death will bring us safely through it and promises that one day we too will rise again from the dead. Third, take courage in Christ's resurrection and exaltation. One of our hymns begins, I serve a risen Savior, he's in the world today. Do you realize that you serve a risen Savior, an exalted Christ? What is your fear? Are you afraid to share Christ with your neighbors and co-workers or relatives? Take courage. We serve a resurrected and exalted Christ. We can be bold and fearless because he is alive. Are you afraid of standing for the truth? Take courage. The one who said, I am the truth, rose again to prove that he was the truth. Are you afraid of wasting your life while you serve the Lord? Take courage. The risen and exalted Christ takes notice of your servant. He brings meaning to the mundane. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. Are you afraid of any illnesses or sicknesses that might befall you? You do not have to be afraid. Because he lives, we can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. We can stand upon him, the resurrected Christ, and say, I am not afraid. Fourth, stand firm on Christ's resurrection and exaltation. This is solid ground for you in a culture that shifts and shakes like an earthquake. Stand firm. Stand firm. Do not doubt it. He is alive and he is at the right hand of God the Father. And thus we are able to stand firm upon that. Though the mountains crumble, though the earth should shake from its place, we can still stand upon him and not be afraid. Go with this as your hope and your confidence. In Jesus' name, let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, his death, his resurrection. We thank you, Lord, that we can stand upon him. And Lord, I pray that you will give us courage Courage in the resurrection. Oh, may you help us to do this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you have your hymns, please turn to hymn number three. Breathe on.